So uh, I would like to talk to you about how to write bottom-up parsers by hand. Um, but before I tell you more about this, uh, why do we want to do that? What are the objectives? So there are two main objectives. The first one is to produce better parsing messages, uh, error messages. And the second one is to carry as much information as possible to the semantic analysis stage. So that's what typically comes after parsing. It's where you do type checking, type inferencing, uh, name binding, this kind of stuff. And we would like to carry as much information as possible, even if the input has syntactic errors. Okay. So, uh, what's wrong with parsed errors? So, um, I took a few examples. So, this is a simple Ruby function that just adds its two inputs. And uh, let's try it out. Does anyone know what that will do? if I type this into a, a REPL? Any idea, any guesses? Don't be shy. <laughs> no one wants to risk it. Does it compile? Does it do an error or, or not? Maybe there's a trick. Okay, so it, it does do an error. Uh, and the reason is that there is a space between the F and the, um, the opening parent. Uh, because in Ruby, you can have a um, parameter list without the parents. And uh, what you use to discriminate that is the space. But if you don't have the parents around the parameter list, you can also have parentized arguments. And so what it does is basically here, um, it says, well, if you had a parent there, it would have been a, a correct call. And what you're seeing here is a failure of the, uh, the heuristic that the parser uses to, uh, to report the error, it, it reports the furthest error position, right? So it says, oh, well, if uh, you had a parent here, it will have been correct. But actually, the real error is there. And to a human, this is obvious, right? But to a parser, it's not that obvious. And I have a, a second example. Uh, someone wants to wager if it works or not. Show your hand if you think it works. If you think it doesn't work, <laughs> this is a really, really risk-averse crowd. Okay, so it doesn't work. Um, it's actually exactly the same error. Uh, and the problem here is that Ruby allows any function to take a block, but that block, so it's, it's the first uh, weird thing, print, right? That must be the last argument of the function. Uh, and this is actually hard-coded into the grammar of Ruby. And so it parses, and then it gets here and says, well, this should be the last argument. So uh, I need to see a closing parent. You don't have it, so you get this weird error. And really, it would have been better if um, it just accepted that, and then later down the line said, well, the block needs to be the last argument, uh, and you have it as the first, so that's not good. Uh, so this brings us to a, a broader point that I want to make is that parser are not language recognizers. Um, I've, syntactic validity is not that useful as a criterion, because when you compile a program, you want to know if it compiles. And compiling is, yes, syntactic validity, but also uh, type correctness, if you have types, and also the result of some static checks. And because you can express something as a syntactic uh, restriction, does not mean you should. All right, so for instance, if you think about keywords, like in a language like Java, you could write in your Java grammar uh, the restriction on which keyword can go where, but it gets really ugly, and it gives you crappy error messages. Whereas if you just say, parse some keywords, and then later, after parsing, you check and say, well, you said the interface was private, but interface cannot be private, that's much clearer. And so I think parser should impose a structure on the input, even if it has errors. Um, and that is especially important if you have an IDE, because you want to derive as much information as possible, even if you're doing some work and there are syntactic errors. And it might be that you have a syntactic error in your function, but maybe the next function is correct, and then you want to know about its type and, and things like that. Um, so how do we do that? How do we avoid errors uh, in the parsing? 
So just don't detect them. And in fact, the approach that I'm, I'm going to suggest doesn't even know what an error is. It just tries to match stuff. And if it can't match stuff, it carries on and goes further into the input and tries to match some other stuff. So there's no built-in concept of error. And it will try to detect error after the parse is finished. So uh, my solution is to, so I don't have really a grammar in the usual sense. It's more a collection of reduction rules. And these are global because they can be applied anywhere in the input. You can reduce a statement in the middle of an expression, for instance. Uh, since I've uh, said at the beginning that you're going to write this by hand, because that's my uh, initial approach, uh, they are written using code, right? So these reduction rules are really just code that takes the stack as an input. Um, I, I will show an example later. And they look at, can we do reductions or not? And there are three important principles for this to, to work in an interesting manner. Is that you want to do, to prioritize reductions over shifts. So, is everyone here uh, familiar with shift reduce parsing, like the very basics of it? You have a question? Oh, you okay. Um, so you want to prioritize reduces over shifts. You want to order the reductions in a way that it's predictable which reduction gets applied, if multiple can apply. And if you cannot do a reduction, then you shift. And this ensures you get to the end of the input and you do as many reductions as possible. If you do that, you will end up with a, a stack that is most reduced. And this stack is what you will use to derive nice error messages and it is also what we will pass to semantic analysis. Uh, as a bonus, the execution model is rather intuitive, which you can use, be, uh, you can make use of, because all your reduction rules are, are custom code, and so you can know where you're at. So let's take an example to make this a bit more concrete. So we have this input, and you have to imagine we're parsing something like C or Java, in which if is not an expression, but it's a statement. So this is incorrect. And furthermore, um, it's doubly incorrect because the body of the if should be a statement as well. And in this case, it's an expression. So I already um, started the parse, and I've shifted two tokens onto the stack. And uh, if we were in a, a traditional like LR parser, uh, this would be it. It would stop here because it makes absolutely no sense in the language to, to have an if token after an equal token. So in our language, we have a collection of rules we're going to consult. But in a LR parser, there would be a LR table. And it would look uh, equal on top of a stack and F on top of the stream. It would say, well, this, is, this matches nothing. So this is an error. I'm just stopping here. But we don't do that. We, we look at our reduction rules. And there's nothing we can do right now. So we shift. And actually, we need to shift uh, four of these tokens because there's nothing we can do. Uh, once you get there, what I did do in my, uh, in my prototype is reduce this into a, an if statement. And it's a bit weird because uh, there's no body in the if. But you know, there's an if keyword, there's a condition. So we might as well assume that the user means that there's an if uh, statement. But you're not forced to do it like that. But that's how I did it. Uh, so we did this reduction. Then uh, we shift B, but we can do an int reduction there because it's an, an expression, not a statement. Uh, and we can do any more reductions. So this is our mo most reduced stack. It's not very much reduced, or, except for this F thing. Uh, but we shall use this example later to see uh, how we can use this stack to derive interesting errors. So uh, I'm going to do two things now. First, talk about some challenges of this approach, some problems with it. And then talk about the really cool stuff, which is like how to derive errors. Uh, problem with this, it's not very good with associativity and precedence. Because we always reduce rather than shift. This is very much left biased. You're always going to get left associativity. Um, for expression, it's not that much of a problem, because you're writing custom code. So you can have a rule 
uh, a reduction rule that basically takes care of building your expression tree and merging the expression at the correct position in the tree. So what I did in my prototype is that I had a, a table with all the precedence and the associativity, and then I just had one reduction rule that just merged the expression tree. And that makes it very easy. It does pose more problem in the case I've called nested associativity. Uh, and basically, so if, uh, I give you a small example. And these are the reduction in the order in which they occur. So first, you're going to reduce the declarator, which is uh, x is an end. You can have that in a declaration or in a um, parameter declaration. Then the declaration without the initializer. Then what you're going to do is uh, actually reduce one as an expression and merge that into the declaration as its initializer. But then later, and actually, no, that's not correct. You need to merge it into the declarator, which is inside the declaration. And then later, you need to merge plus one into the expression, which is in the declarator, which is in the declaration. So if you think that's ugly, uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, this is the most annoying thing about this approach, and I'm trying to get rid of it. Uh, what I've done right now, I can explain briefly, is basically a concept of extractor. So you can kind of dig into the top item of the stack and say, well, I, I need an expression. Is there an expression at the end of this thing? Um, and this is annoying because it adds a lot of questions. So if you're writing a reduction rule, you need to, um, to ask yourself, well, wait, do I need to call an extractor here? And if you add a new AST node type, you need to ask yourself, well, is this going to be uh, nested inside something so I need to extract it? Or is this going to be around something that I need to extract? And this can of go against uh, modularity because each time you add something, you need to think, wait, how does this relate with all the other stuff? And so it's not very really clean. But in my um, uh, prototype, which is basically, you can think of it as a, like, simple C without pointer or a Java without classes, a very, very simple language. Um, I only needed extractors for expressions and types to give you an idea. OK, now to the cool stuff. Uh, so we do parse the input completely, get a reduce stack. And then we apply a bunch of error reports. So you, you could think of them as error detection rules. And they look for failed reduction. So they look for uh, patterns of stuff where you say, oh, there, if I had this token of maybe this token was missing, I could have done a reduction. And you can also encode common errors that you know that programmer do. So you're not limited to uh, mechanical stuff. And uh, the approach I did to implement that is, is run some regexes over the objects of the stack, but you could do it in other ways as well. And you can take this approach uh, even further, which is, well, if you detect a failed reduction, you might as well do the reduction. Uh, partially, of course, because you don't know the programmer intent. And once you've done this reduction, maybe it unlocks additional reductions. Maybe you can detect some uh, higher level errors, and so you get a kind of a cascade of uh, error detection and reductions. Very simple examples of stack uh, of before. Uh, in this case, you can imagine that you have an error corrector that uh, looks at all the expressions in the stack and say, well, if this, if this were a statement, uh, would it make sense? And in this case, it makes sense twice. To, um, it, would, it would enable us to reduce all this into a single if statement. So these are uh, points two and three. And then there is the obvious one, which is, well, you're trying to assign a statement uh, to a variable, which makes no sense. This also outlines a few challenges, which is that um, on a typical input, you're going to get a lot of errors if your file has, has errors. And which one do you, you report, right? Do you do the whole trace? So in this case, it's very simple, but it's a very small input. Um, or do you do the first one? Or also, these errors might be conflicting. So they might be overlap into the pattern that you detect. Uh, just have two slides more, so I'm done. 
Uh, and so, you know, how do you do that? So in conclusion, um, the approach I think is interesting because it does achieve the um, objective we, we said at the, at the start, so error correction and uh, more information syntactic uh, for a semantic analysis. An open question, can we get rid of the nasty problem of nested associativity? Can we make this into a framework instead of uh, having it a handwritten pattern? And is there a useful formalizable subset? And if you want to help on this, I'd be happy to talk to you. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.